And I was at a friend's house. The kid was playing with the iPad, watching uh, uh, watching YouTube, and the and the app fell asleep. And seeing the kid laugh, and then kind of just giving up and be like, "All right, it's over." And then that was it. it was such a moment of success where I was like, "This is amazing!" Look, like they they are not fighting. It's and I'm sure there's parents out there that didn't yeah. have that smooth of a time. Right. But I was lucky to see one of the good instances, obviously. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Stefan Christensen, creative director at design and experience agency, Jam3. Stefan was born and raised in Denmark and is currently based in Toronto. He specializes in digital products and experiences, as well as branding and illustration across all platforms. Stefan believes that great work should always be well made, have that human touch, and hopefully make you smile. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Stefan Christensen. Okay, kids, all the way from Toronto, I'm chatting with Stefan Christensen. Stefan, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you here. And um, I guess just to make note, at the time of recording, we're in April of 2020 in the midst of quarantine and all this COVID craziness in the world. How are you doing? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a very social guy. I think I'm considered an extrovert. So being being locked up at home is not my <laughs> favorite, I will say. Uh, I've, I've been coping with it, doing a lot of cooking and, you know, playing a lot of video games and a lot of reading. So I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, but uh, I miss I miss my friends. I miss my colleagues, and and I wish I didn't have to do all my work through like Zoom and Hangout. But it is it is what it is. Yeah, I was uh, I was supposed to make my first trip to Toronto in June uh, for a, a board meeting, and now I'm not sure that's happening. And I'm I'm really bummed because this is a place that's high on my list. I've heard Toronto is really cool. How long have you been there? I've been here about two years from now. Uh, came came up here. Uh, I lived in New York City prior to this. Um, so is is Toronto handling things well, or is everything pretty shut down, or like how is it going just in the city there? I think uh, you know. Again, all things considered, I, I do think Toronto is handling pretty well. Canada in general. Could, that could be much worse. Uh, and again, I mean, so I lived in New York prior to coming up here. And <laughs> I am guilty of thinking that right now I'm pretty excited that I'm not in New York anymore, given how oh, things yeah. have escalated there um, and being on the Canadian side of the border. So, yeah, I, th- I think things are okay here. Uh, things got closed down very early. Uh, there's like, you go to the grocery shop, you have to stand in line outside six feet apart. So in that sense, it's, it's a bit inconvenient, but, uh, but I think the city has been handling it pretty well. Yeah, that's good. Well, I do want to talk more about GM three, but maybe before we get into that, um, I want to ask you about your origin story and how you found yourself in this world of design and interactive experiences. You know, what, how'd you get started? Uh, yeah, so I was like, um, I was bit by a radioactive pencil. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I mean, I started pretty early. I was, I was, I was not very old. Uh, I think in second grade, uh, when I sat next to a guy in school and he was really good at drawing and I'm, I'm out from, I'm from Denmark, but I'm not from the cool part of Denmark. I'm not from Copenhagen, sadly. <laughs> I'm from the middle of nowhere, really far up north, like 210 people doing that. Uh, so up there, out in the middle of nowhere, I was sitting sitting next to this guy, and he was really good at drawing. And it it fascinated me a lot because I was like, whoa, he's able to, like, the things up in his head, he can, like, show other people. Mm. And uh, that was a problem I had when I was a kid. When I was playing with people, it really bothered me that all these things I had in my head, you wouldn't know what that looked like. Oh, and interesting. So, so I picked up drawing uh, so I could like start visualizing those things. 
and got really into it. And, you know, back then Pokemon was huge. Now it's huge again, which is funny, but uh, I could draw all the Pokemons and I was super into it. And so I wanted to make uh, animation and I wanted to be a character designer. And then, then as years passed, I realized to do that, you have to draw the same drawing over and over again. And that didn't seem <laughs> right. so so overly <laughs> exciting. Uh, so then I started shifting more to illustration. Then I learned about what graphic design was uh, and, uh, and got really excited about that. I was like, whoa, like things I see around me have been made by people. Maybe I can do that too. Yeah, that sounds way better than drawing the same thing slightly different 24 times every every second. Is that what that is? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so then I got into graphic design and started practicing that uh, and then eventually went to design school in Denmark. And then uh, at the end of design school, I got my first internship. And I was so excited. I was like, whoa, someone is getting paid to do this. Like... That's their job. That's so cool. And now I get to like learn from them. And that was in the, that was at an agency in Copenhagen. So now I moved to Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. So now then I you were in the cool part. <laughs> I was finally in the cool part. And, and I remember it's like a whole new world. I was like, the city is so big. Uh, and then I worked at that agency. They were called Hello Monday. And I got the job after uh, afterwards uh, working there, and then eventually they transferred me to their New York office. So that's how I ended up there, um, and then uh, spent years in New York, and then eventually uh, uh, got into conversations with Jam Three, and they were right up in Toronto, so it wasn't that far away. And I was like, "Let's let's do it." And then I moved up here, and the rest is history. So, uh, GM three, at least from my website stalking, you have about a hundred employees across four different, uh, fairly international offices, right? So you guys are, are somewhat distributed to begin with. So, um, do team members within each office kind of tend to, you know, does the Toronto team tend to work independently of the other three offices or do you guys do a lot of work together? We definitely do a lot of work together. The the biggest office, the headquarter, is is here in Toronto. So more or less the entire creative team is there. So that naturally makes everyone else depending on that office, right? Yeah. But I think it's nice because it makes everyone cross collaborate. So for example, our LA office, uh, we are on projects with everyone over there all the time and see them on pretty much a daily basis, right? Mm. Over hangouts. Uh, so it's nice. It make you make sure everyone feels connected, even though you're not sitting in the in the same location necessarily. Now, given that everybody's doing the work from home thing right now, were you guys doing much of that before we went into COVID land, or were most people coming into the various offices to work daily? I think for the I think for our Los Angeles team, this is not so much different in the relationship of like running a lot of projects over like a Google Hangouts to say Mm -hmm. um, for everyone in Toronto, it's definitely a bit more, a bit different because like around 80 people in an office and everyone coming in every day. And obviously every day, someone also working from home. I think it's very rare. Everyone is at the office at the same time, but definitely a very daily cadence of seeing people, hanging out with people, you know, chatting, having fun. And it's been interesting after these, I think it's, we've been at home four or five weeks now. There, there's a lot of people you see every day and you talk to every day that you now haven't seen for weeks because you're not on a project with them. Yeah. Uh, so, so in that sense, it's, it's definitely different. So in our industry, titles are funny because you could have the same title at a different company and have a wildly different job. So, you know, some creative directors are more writers or more conceptual or more more managers of projects or, you know, high level direction. And some creative directors are totally, you know, fingers in the pie. So I'm just curious kind of what, what a normal day looks like and what your role as creative director looks like at GM3. Yeah, totally. It, um, so I, I come from the design background and I come from interactive design and, and branding as well. Uh, and where that, that bridge meets, uh, and, 
the scientist in, in general, uh, very passionate, very excited about it. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from uh, now in the position where I'm in today. But what a regular day looks like today is I'll be on uh, I'll be on a handful of projects. Uh, I would say typically around probably five. Some of them will be in you know in different phases. Uh, uh, on some of the ones that are more well developed, I'm mainly managing the project, uh, giving oversight, helping the team uh, move it forward, um, but more from a high level perspective. Projects that are just kicking off or new, fresh in the door that needs more like creative definition, there I'll be more involved. I'll still work with uh, a designer, but I'll be very concept- conceptually involved. Uh, try to make sure we are coming in with the right angle, we're telling the right story, or we are pushing the concept to where it needs to go. Um, And I do that a lot because back when I was a designer as well, uh, I think think the edge I I was able to like get into my work always came through the idea. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, yes, it had to look great as well, but if it didn't have a good idea, then I couldn't stand by it. If it didn't have a twist or a story or a different thing that made it different, then I was like, this is not good enough. Now it's just a good layout I've made and I'm proud of the layout, but it's not enough. It needs to, it needs to communicate something. And what you mentioned in the beginning, if I can make you smile or feel something, then I've achieved the goal. And that was Where do you think very, that came from? Yeah. Like what what was the what was the inspiration or what's the thing that taught you? that there has to be more to it than just something that looks nice? Uh, I think part of it is a, a pure rebelliousness, not wanting <laughs> to do what, like if everyone does one thing, then I don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, just like in life. Uh, but I think it also came in um, the school I went to. I was lucky to be part of a class where everyone was very motivated. So everyone was kind of like, you know, it's healthy competition. Everyone yeah. was pushing each other. So this idea that if you wanted to stay ahead of the game, you had to keep pushing your own idea of what something was got distilled in there. And then joining uh, the company Hello Monday later, uh, there was also something they did very much in their work and why I was attracted back then as well. Because uh, I could see all these like fun ideas that would shine through in the work. And so that was really amazing. So I had a lot of good influence from from... Uh, from my upbringing there as well, uh, that just got more and more distilled in me. And then I think over time, it was also a matter of like seeing when I do this, my impact is better, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, people smile more when they see my projects. Uh, People are way more interested in it when it has an interesting edge. So there must be something to it, right? Like it must drive a a better impact when it has, has a twist or something that's different in it than than what you would usually see. So do you think coming to the world of digital experiences from more of the design and brand background, was, was that helpful or was it more difficult to figure out digital experiences, you know, having more of a, of a brand background? I think, uh, I think it helped a lot. Maybe, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the like different abilities I managed to pick up over the years, I feel like have helped. Because in interactive, you know, it's often it's a little bit of a blank window where you can just do not whatever you want. There are some technical <laughs> constraints, but they keep changing. Yeah. So this window just keeps evolving in what it can do. Um, and coming from a background where, where you're a bit more imaginative definitely helped and thinking about uh, I know this whole idea of like, what is it communicating? How does it make me feel? It's very similar to brain thinking sometimes, right? What mm-hmm. should this brain make me feel? Why does it behave this way? Why does it talk this way? Well, because we want you to feel this way about it. And then uh, as I learned about user experience and and you know how uh, how you can UX, uh, UX to create certain feelings and make certain things feel a certain way when you use it. Yeah. That was like a really interesting bridge because now you could combine it. So now I could design something that could make you feel a certain way because of the way it behaves. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
And so that's always a super fun challenge and fun to push that as well. Uh, plus in general, just pushing like what can be inside that little browser window uh, and how can some of those technologies, at least nowadays, also start bleeding into the world as well um, in things that are more immersive or something that could be an installation that's digitally driven but does exist in a physical world. So in that sense, it's a very exciting field. So does Jam3 do a pretty even split of things that are just purely browser-based and things that are more immersive, or do you guys tend to find you're doing more of one or the other? I think um, if talking about like the pure bulk of work, I think it's definitely 75% of things that you would consider web-based, right? Mm -hmm. It's in a browser, it's on your phone, it's in your computer. Um, And then we have a a fourth, I would say, always depends on the clients where that digital starts bleeding into the real world. Um, some of the work uh, we did for Levi's, which is super interesting because it is actually a web build, but it's then connected to a physical installation that that drops these limited edition genes, right? So I think it's a good example of where digital and physical can start merging and, and there'll probably be more of that in the future as well, I'm sure. Well, maybe that's a good segue to talk about um, a case study that you did with uh, with Postmates. So, talk a little bit about how that experience worked within the the real world. Yeah, so that that was uh, that was a very interesting project, and it's also a very interesting project given the times we live in right now as we speak. Because uh, Postmates had developed uh, a robot, automated little robot with the goal of having that robot help uh, deliver food. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right now, uh, so you basically be able to go onto Postmates, let's say you order a burrito, and this little R2-D2 looking thing can roll up to your door and deliver. And this way uh, they could help small businesses expand their reach because the robot can drive further, mm-hmm. those kind of things. Um, and, and that was a super interesting challenge because we had to help them uh, kind of like launch this thing uh, at least on the web and kind of tell the story and introduce this little guy to the world which is very it was a very interesting challenge in sense of like how do you tell that story how yeah. do you tell a appealing story about a delivery robot <laughs> and how do you get it framed up uh, correctly so you tell the story from a sense of like how this is helping people and how it's not supposed to take everyone's jobs, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, and, and that was super fun and it, it netted out, uh, it was a great couple of collaboration, but it netted out with this like interactive narrative that basically takes you through the journey of an order f- uh, from uh, an order of some tacos or burrito comes in. And now this robot drives out and needs to go on the street and needs to go on his journey to at the end of the experience, then like open up and deliver your burrito. So you kind of use that frame of looking at him going through the streets, navigating the real world. Uh, you use that narrative to then talk about the different features of the product mm. and some of the ethical questions around it and some of the technologies behind it that makes it possible. So it's almost like a hero's journey framework of, of the robot where the, the robot becomes your hero. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. And and now everyone who's listening is about to order some some Mexican food, I think. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. It, it was uh, so they're running a trial of it I think in Los Angeles right now. Mm-hmm. And um and a friend of mine sent like a link to a tweet where someone had recorded they were driving next to the actual robot driving around. <laughs> I was like, "Holy moly, look mm-hmm. at that. There it is." Uh, so it's really fun. Marketing come to life. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe talking about another case study, I know you guys did some, some work with Twitter recently around trends and kind of collecting data over time. Um, what did that project look like? Yes. So we, uh, so Twitter reached out to us, uh, they had done some really, I always get really excited when a client comes with something really different mm. they have done, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you have a robot. <laughs> uh, that's cool. I, I'm yeah. listening, you know, um, right. 
I, I have this belief that you can make everything really interesting if you find the right angle on it. Uh, so when people show up with something unexpected, yeah, if you start out get, with a delivery robot, that's a pretty cool. <laughs> you don't have to look too start, far to right? find the angle. <laughs> yeah, because there's there where you're gonna hang your hat. People haven't done it before, so you need to be creative, which is like super fun. Yeah, and in and in this case, uh, Twitter had analyzed. Uh, I don't remember how many billions of tweets, but it was in the billions mm. over the past uh, five years. And then from there, uh, they still uh, a series of like conversations, trends and conversations saying like, well, it turns out that the past five years, looking at all these tweets, here are some key themes we've been talking about. Right? Mm. Uh, we've been talking about sustainability was one of the examples and mindfulness and things like that. So super interesting. So they came and said, so we have all this data and now we we want to make an experience around it that can tell that story. And so a marketer, a marketer for example, can come in, go through these uh, insights of culture and, and learn from it. Uh, and that was super interesting challenge because uh, how do you how do you tell a story with data, right? How do you make it mm -hmm. an appealing experience to learn about uh, data? And in this project, it was a similar approach of like finding the right right angle of it, where you you use the data to tell a story instead of just letting the data tell the story, right? The data just becomes the supporting fact of it. Um, and it turned out to the, it turned out as this interactive narrative where you dive into these different trends, and then each trend is a little narrative, saying like over the past five years, seventy there's been an uprise of seventy five percent in conversations around sustainability. People are talking about this because A B C, and then and then mm. the story goes on. But um, a super super interesting project, especially also from that problem again of saying like how do you take something how do you take that like raw data and then turn it into something interesting that people want to interact with so um how do you do that <laughs> so what <laughs> what was the direction that you guys took um how do you do that I, I feel like it's always a bit different every time i think uh, it's a lot of sitting with the team and brainstorming and trying to, you know, shine light at something, try to come in from different angles. What if we saw it from the robot's perspective? Mm -hmm. What if we saw it from, and then in this case, what if we saw it from the perspective of the graph? What if the graph tells the whole story? Mm. Ah, okay, that's interesting. And then that informs uh, another idea. So I feel like it's a lot about perspective in general. Um, uh, I tell a lot of the team as well that, it's often a lot about getting out of your comfort zone as well and uh, trying to like push yourself out where you're a bit uncomfortable. So you start uh, uh, finding some different perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. I say, ah, I hadn't thought of it from that angle, right? If we came in from the lift or look, put the camera up here, now suddenly it makes sense, right? So I, I, so I think it's a, I think it's a lot of that. Um, and and then even from like a GM3 perspective, I think it's a lot about always finding, asking yourself like, how can I tell this as a story? How do I how do I inject a story into this? Um, I think I, I read once, and when I read it, it was so not surprising, mm -hmm. but still like exciting that uh, that when you're told a story compared to being told facts there are more parts of your brain that gets activated. So when yeah. I tell you facts, your language processor is running, but that's it. But if I tell you a story, there's all kinds of processes going on in there. And I was like, this is so true. Like when you're being told a good story, you can kind of feel how it tickles, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain. You just kind of feel it. It feels really good. And a good story is just very satisfying. And I think knowing that is something that's really interesting to apply to one's work as well as saying like, how do I, how do I, how do I get a story into this? Because it would be more interesting for people to interact with if it's story driven. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting too how um, how easy it is, at least for me personally, to to see myself in other stories, even if it's not a story that I necessarily relate to. I immediately think, what would I be like in that in that place? Yeah, or yeah, what, yeah. what might I be like in that situation? And so, as opposed to facts, when you hear about facts about a a world event, you don't necessarily think of yourself in it. But when you hear it as a story, there's there's just something about that that's really cool. So with all of these amazing clients, you know, Twitter and Postmates, you guys have done work for Facebook, for Adidas. Um, and, and I'm sure some of our listeners would say, man, if, if Adidas walked in the door, of course we'd work with them. But how do you determine when a client comes to you guys, who's going to be a good fit or maybe what are some red flags that you might look out for in a client or project that, that would be a bad fit for you guys? Totally. We... We try to pair them up with some of our own values and goals. So as a company in general, we're very driven. Uh, we used to say we're very driven to try to create a tomorrow's experience, like something that's forward thinking, something that's challenging the norm and trying to move the needle forward. Um, so when engaging with a, a client, that's always something we look at is like, uh, uh, look at the brief. Is this something? Uh, is this client aligned on that goal? Do they want to move that? Looking to try to make tomorrow's experience. Um, it's a, a huge factor. Then there's uh, cultural things as well. Like, are they a culturally a good fit for us? Like, uh, who are the people on the other side? Is that's someone we are super excited to collaborate with? Mm -hmm. And what's the opportunity overall? Um, so there, there's a lot of parameters there. So what do you think is one of your proudest professional moments so far? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great question. I think, uh, when I was really early in my career, I just moved to New York, uh, a, a pitch came in the door from YouTube, uh, and they were making YouTube for children, YouTube kits mm, yeah. and needed uh, to get that whole product designed and develop a brand around. It. And I, I mean, I already told you, I wanted to be a character designer and I spent a lot of my childhood watching Cartoon Network, for example. So when I saw that brief, I was like, oh my God, this is my opportunity mm -hmm. to make my version of Cartoon Network. Um, so I worked with uh, my boss at the time on that pitch and we had so much fun and then we won it. Mm. And then over the next year and a half, we uh, did a lot of work with YouTube uh, on making that thing to come to life. And normally I don't like working on projects that are too long, but that one was because uh, like the amount of personal excitement that came into it uh, it was 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 so fun, right? And you like inject some of your personality. We designed characters, and those characters mm -hmm. had personalities, right? And um, and then and then the moment that launched was probably the first time in my career where I saw like real impact, where the thing got downloaded eight million times oh, wow. uh, within the first couple of days. And I remember there was this one specific feature where you could set a timer. So when you don't want the kids to watch more, more YouTube, then it shuts down. Yeah. And that was something we've been thinking a lot about. How do you make that in one transaction between the, the parent and the kid a bit more smooth? Because yeah. that can be quite frictional. <laughs> right? Instant fit. <laughs> oh, exactly. So what the app did was literally falling asleep. The space came up, yawned, and fell asleep. Mm. And it was a way to indicate, hey, it's bedtime. Yeah, uh, and I was at a friend's house. The kid was playing with the iPad, watching uh, uh, watching YouTube, and the and the app fell asleep. And seeing the kid laugh, and then kind of just giving up and be like, "All right, it's over." And then that was it. it was such a moment of success where I was like, "This is amazing!" Look, like they they are not fighting. It's and I'm sure there's parents out there that didn't yeah. have that smooth of a time. Right. But I was lucky to see one of the good instances, obviously. That's really cool. Um, do you have any design heroes or people that you looked up to as you were coming up in the in the industry, or maybe even favorite designers currently? 
Uh, yeah, so my my inspiration is always a bit funny. It's uh, I think like obviously I look up a lot to Pixar and the way mm. they think of creative process and story, and that's always been like a a guiding compass as well. Like back in the days, early days of Walt Disney, when they invented the storyboard, to me is such an inspiration of saying like they just invented a way of working that makes your your output better. So I look uh, like I look up to that a lot, um, and I think I tend to look up to things like that a bit more than I I look up directly to designers. Yeah, that's super cool. I I just saw um, a Medium post this week. It's actually a really long article, but it was about using the idea of storyboarding to define. Uh, I think they were calling it more more customer journey or client experience mm-hmm. stuff. But it was it was a really well thought out piece. Maybe we'll link to that in the show notes too. But I've been thinking a lot about storyboarding lately, just because of that. I thought that was a pretty cool way to look at it. Yeah, and it, it's super interesting. We've we've done it on some projects where I think traditionally you will you'll do a digital project this way that okay it kicks off, you do some user journeys, those things, and then you start wireframe, which is like a low fidelity version of the website mm-hmm. to get the functionality in there. And something we've applied on a couple of projects was saying like, well, if we're trying to make a story driven experience, can't we learn? From, for example, back in the days with Walt Disney's people that focused on story first, what did they do? Uh, and you know, they start. You start with a script, figure out what's my narrative, what's my story. Then you storyboard it to make sure the, your your movie is coming together really nicely. Yeah. And then you go and produce it. So we applied that um, on a couple of projects where we said, like, before we even think of anything, let's together write the script of what the story is and what we need to tell. And then after that, we'll use that script to then plan out what kind of visual narrative comes along with this. How do we tie that up with user interaction, sitemaps, all of those things, and then move it into production. And it's been really, really interesting because it's also affected the way the way you think of it. Because once you do a storyboard, you think of things as a sequence and not as like a long image, for example. Mm-hmm. So it's made our work uh, more interactive and more driven by motion as well, because you you're focusing on like what is the sequence of events that'll tell me the story I need to I need to experience. Yeah, as opposed to just making the long page look pretty or <laughs> yeah, exactly. making the buttons stand out more or whatever. Exactly. Um, so your answer may be different now because of all of our quarantine. And which is totally okay to this question, but, um, this can be anything, but designers that I interview on this show, I find are typically obsessed with something (laughs) we tend to, as, as creatives and designers tend to chase after these obsessions. I'm curious what you find you are most obsessed with right now. Right, right now, right now, right now. (laughs) Um, During these quantum times, yeah, I'm definitely obsessed with uh, cooking and baking. I've been making a lot of sourdough bread, mm. trying to perfect that. Um, I get into a lot of things where I think it's fun, and then I try to be as good at it as possible. Um, that's definitely a big, big one. Uh, I'm a bit obsessed with making music recently as well. Back when I was a teen, I played in bands and I played synthesizers, and that's something mm. I picked up again in in my later twenties as well. So that's been great. Um, I think those are my two my two. I, oh, and the new season of Westworld. Oh, oh. Obviously, very obsessed with that too. Very cool. I have not gotten into the new season yet, but I've got some catching up to do. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And are you publishing the the music anywhere or is it just for, for you at this point? It's uh, I'm doing it with a couple of friends and we are going to publish it, but uh, we need to, it needs some more production work. Before. <laughs> All right. bit, I think we're a bit too precious, you know, like it needs to be perfect. <laughs> well, when, when it's ready, maybe by the time this uh, podcast episode airs, then maybe you'll be ready to share it in the show notes. Hopefully. We shall see. We'll be waiting for that. Um, 
I know you've had the opportunity to work with some pretty amazing clients at this point, um, still pretty early in your career, all things considered. Do you have any like dream clients or dream projects or things that you want to tackle in the future that you haven't had a chance to do yet? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I was once asked what my dream client was and rather than naming a brand, I said, it's less so who, who it is and it's more so what they're setting out to do. Uh, so any client that comes with a, a weird problem to solve that hasn't been solved before or has a vision of a, uh, of a very interesting new way of doing something is in general where uh, my, my appetite is. And also where I think I'm the best at helping people on this trip. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do, obviously, I do have a couple of brands I look up to and think are really amazing. One is uh, called Teenage Engineering. They do, well, it's hard to say what they do, but they do do musical instruments uh, and a lot of like creative engineering and products. Mm-hmm. And their design philosophy uh, is so different from so many other things. And I'm so curious about how they work. So if they ever want to work with me, and if they ever hear this, then I am I am I'm all yours. <laughs> nice. Any other ones that stick out? I think I think that's the that's the main one. Oh, the main and one. obviously, uh, Pixar Cartoon Network. Just just call me right up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Internet. If you've got connections, <laughs> yeah. send them to GM Three. Um. What about like rough spots or, um, or just when you get stuck? So especially in quarantine, I think maybe more of us are feeling this more often than usual, but when you're feeling overwhelmed or stuck or not getting to an idea, what's, what's kind of your process or your, um, your go-to to get out of that spot? It's a, it's tricky because you know, you never know how long it's going to last. Sometimes mm-hmm. you're just stuck for way longer than you want to be. Uh, and you kind of have to be creative on command. Um, I, I try to, I mean, here, if I was cool, I would say I work out. <laughs> I'm not cool. So I just go for long walks, get a lot of fresh air. I, I find that physically walking smoothens up my gears a little bit of thinking. Uh and you know that feeling when like you've been thinking so hard on something, you just can't crack it. And then when you stop thinking about it, that's when the blocker comes down and then you solve it. So I, I try to kind of force that sometimes by saying, okay, I'm forcefully not going to think about this. I'm going to go for a walk, I'm going to chill, just do something else. But I do think the most effective way, and this is definitely the, something I'm lacking when I'm in, in quarantine, is uh, just talking with someone else, mm-hmm. right? Poke, poke your colleague on the shoulder and say, hey, have a look at this or ask them a question. And they might say two words and that's all it takes for you to be like, ah, yeah, I haven't thought of it that way. And now suddenly your stream of conscience just runs again. Yeah. Um, so during these times, I try to overshare a lot of things that I'm very not done, things that are very rough, just so you can kind of get it in front of people and get their get their reactions to it. Is there anything in the world of design or uh, in the interactive world that's that's maybe a trend or something that you see frequently that kind of drives you crazy? Hey, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, not in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I think I'm very, I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and I'm also very passionate, right? So, yeah. uh, and I'm very, very passionate about things being the best they can possibly be. Uh, one thing, and this might stir up some opinions, and I kind of hope it does. Uh, I think over the past decade, we have built up a practice and an idea that there's something called visual design and there's something called UX design. Mm-hmm. And that's not the same thing. Um, and so people will practice these things separately. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity uh, because I think design is like form and function and how that comes together. And I would argue there's also an element that's at least when a lot of these interactive things, if it's a story, it's form, function, and then story or content, right? Like mm-hmm. what's the content, what's the form and function that wraps around and how, how does that interplay with me? Um, 
And I would love to see the design industry going in a direction where we kind of meet more in the middle and become a bit more cross-functional uh, and see less of like uh, separating of disciplines because I do believe that the best work is done when these things are thought out in the same environment and not mm. done as like two isolated disciplines. And then I'll do something and then I'll hand it over to you and then you do your thing and then it goes over to development and then it's done. I, yeah. uh, I think it's, I think the best work comes to life when, when all those kind of thinking methods kind of meet in the middle to, uh, to make something, to create something. Yeah. I might even offer, offer that, um, even if those are two different sets of hands that are looking at UX and visual design, that they're happening at the same time, that they're thinking yeah, about exactly. the, solving the problem together. It's not happening in silos. Yeah, exactly. Because I, 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 I mean, I know the comfort of designing a process that looks linear, mm -hmm. but I find in reality, it's a bit more messy. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, it's hard to sell something that's really messy and say, hey, how about this sack of messiness? Why don't you pay me for that? But I find the reality behind the curtain, tends, things tend to work a bit better when it does get a bit messy. Uh, and when you, know, when you don't make all the decisions in the most perfect linear matter. Yeah, the uh, Gantt chart might look better on the process page of your website, but... Uh... Everybody Absolutely. knows that's not how it actually works. Yeah. <laughs> or at least that's not how it ever worked for me. Um, what do you think is maybe your favorite piece of advice that you have received, or maybe one of your favorite pieces of advice to share with uh, people on your team? Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, I was told early on, and I really like that advice saying like, uh, that was the, the first creative director I worked for when I was a designer. Uh, he said, um, you know, it always needs a twist. Mm. Uh, what's the twist? So it's okay to make something. If you're trying to innovate, you don't need to innovate the entire thing. Mm -hmm. You need to add the twist. What's that like? One thing that's like, oh, it's like that, but with this. Yeah. Um, and I thought... To me, that's such simple, snackable advice that mm -hmm. it's easy to apply to anyone on whatever you're doing, right? Um, without having to think too much about what that means. Uh, so if you sit with some work right now and you're a bit stuck on it, or it doesn't feel right, you can always ask yourself, like, well, maybe I'm missing a twist. What could that twist be? Mm, yeah, that's great. And can definitely hear that advice has permeated kind of in how you operate as a professional. Yeah, totally. Um, and then I, some of the, some of the advice from my own perspective, I think that is that, you know, there's no boring briefs, there's boring ideas and executions. So like, mm -hmm. uh, I truly do believe everything can be made really interesting if you can find the right angle in on it. Um, and I, I think that's something I, I was lucky to kind of realize it early on, I think, but I think it's not, uh, for example, in design school, it's not clearly enough educated that, you know, uh, to practice design, that's also part of your responsibility is to be the one that comes up with the interesting way in yeah. uh, or making it interesting. I don't think I've seen many briefs so far that just come in and they are just gorgeous, you know. They, ooh, you just this hand is it all just, to you. <laughs> it's just, I just got to start making this thing. It's just going to make itself. They always look a bit rough around the edges. So like mm -hmm. finding that silver lining in it and say, you know what? This is really interesting because of this. And if we come in from this angle, then it's suddenly a really exciting project. Uh, that's something I would encourage everyone to start uh, trying to practice. That's awesome. Um, Maybe in addition to that, any other asks or encouragements that you would like to pass along to our audience? Uh, get enough sleep. <laughs> it's uh, the, the pulling all nighters and working constantly. I think it's overrated. It's, yeah. it's better to have persistence, uh, rhythm and get enough sleep. That's great. Well, Stefan, before we let you go, tell our, our, uh, fans and online listeners where they can, um, find you on the interwebs and maybe where they could connect with you and jam three later. Yep. Uh, you can, uh, all my contact information 
is on my website, which is stephanchristensen.me. And then you can always, there's my email. I think even my phone number is in there. So if you want to shoot me a text, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer. Um, and uh, there will be a link to my Instagram, all that stuff too. Awesome. Well, we will link to all of that stuff in the show notes. Maybe we'll leave your mobile number just on your website. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Uh, just, just call me up. I'm happy to chat. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for being here and thanks for being obsessed with design. Thank you. Okay, kids, that's episode number 141 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. There's an imminent storm. It's